The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning and welcome to Southside Bible Church. We're grateful for anyone who's come to, to be with us and uh, to worship. Uh, just grateful for you to be here with us and that you will be blessed in our worship. Uh, we now are going to worship through the proclaimed Word of God. Um, this morning we're going to be taking in our study back up in Second Peter, so if you'll turn to chapter 3, we'll be looking at verses 10 through 14. I love these verses that are before us. We're, we're looking at the promise at the second coming of Jesus Christ and His imminent return, the climactic event of history with the ushering into the eternal state, with the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells. So many times we can get lost in the details of trying to figure out every detail of prophecy and how it will unfold, which I believe is a pursuit that every believer should be after. But sometimes we can forget the main reason that God uh, gave us the clear teaching of the second coming of Christ into this world and what it will produce as a church of God as we are waiting for this climactic moment. And that is what Peter is going to exhort us in this morning. And so it is my prayer that God will produce a people hastening the coming of the day of the Lord in holy conduct and godliness, that the certainty of his coming would, would do its work in every heart this morning. I've been before the throne of grace asking God to give that to every heart this morning. So let's go uh, to our king and pray that he will produce that fruit from the word of God taught this morning. Father, we come before you, and I love that hymn that we just sang, and I thank you for its history, and I thank you that you began a reformation through stirring the heart of, of one man in justification by faith in Christ alone. I thank you, God, that we now eat the fruit of those truths. I pray now, God, as we've been looking at this glorious gospel through Peter, and now we'll look at this sure return of our King. Lord, I pray that it would do its work in every heart here this morning. There is a specific individual need in every heart with this truth, and, and only your Holy Spirit can do such a beautiful thing and apply it personally right to their own hearts. May you do that work now, God, in every heart, we pray. Illuminate this word. Amen. Well, in our passage this morning, Peter's going to proclaim the absolute certainty of the coming of the day of the Lord, the day that has been described and detailed and prophesied throughout the Old Testament. We've been studying it in Sunday school in the Thessalonians uh, class, and so I encourage you, uh, there's great uh, notes that are available if you'd like to dig in and see what all we've been looking at. Uh, the day of Christ was, was told of, and it's told us to be looking for it. The day that the New Testament writers are flushing out even more and keep calling us to, to fix our hope upon it. The day that, that, as Greg read from Isaiah 65, is where Peter will be taking this, the, the passage where, while there is uh, much that the writers of Scripture teach about the day of the Lord, Peter in this passage is going to be narrowing down uh, on the judgment and the eternal state. And so I just want you to, to see that as I was studying, it's like every writer uh, never tries to give you all the exact detail of the unfolding of eschatology, but it seems as if they pick certain parts of it and details for the point they're driving for their readers. And that is what I see in Peter. So he's not giving you the fullness of all that will come in the day of the Lord, but he's drawing out these two very specific parts of it. So there's much understanding of this, but I'm narrowing it down as Peter has for a very specific reason. And as I gave some thought to this day of the Lord and what will this be, my heart has been overwhelmed uh, in Sunday school as we've been studying this. And it's just going to be a day where Christ will put on his full display of his glory. When he came the first time, it was an eclipsed glory. And this time it will be in the fullness, uneclipsed for, for us to see. And as I began just kind of pondering this day, I, what came to my mind, I don't know why, is like a wedding day uh, for a bride and a groom. And that is a day when, when everyone comes and, and they just treat you as special. It, it's, it's you're the focus. You're what they're there for and what they're watching. Or, or maybe growing up when you had a birthday, it was kind of your day. When you grew up with six brothers, it, it felt good to have kind of one day uh, that was your day. Uh, the day of the Lord is his day. 
And it's when he puts on display all of his glory, where every knee will bow, every tongue will confess he's Lord, he'll be adored and worshiped. I'm telling you, no more eclipsed glory, just full, bright, and radiant. And he will judge and he will remove all unrighteousness from this earth. And we read it in Revelation, and it's awesome and spectacular, but, but this glory will come and it will drive out all unrighteousness. And Peter focuses on the fire, the purging, and the transformation that will come to this universe where, where righteousness now will come forth and dwell forever, and there'll be no more intrusions or interruptions into this eternal state forever called unrighteousness. It will never come into this new kingdom ever again. He'll banish it forever. It's his day. I cannot wait. In verse 10, Peter tells us about it. He said, this day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. It's going to come like a thief, not uh, expected. I remember at, at seminary, I would come out every day. My, my wife worked uh, at, at the seminary and it was just you know, like clockwork. I'd go pick her up and we would leave from the trailer and we'd go out and get in my car. And, and one night we came out and I'm like, where's my car? Uh, it, it's gone. And the police come and say, it's a Tijuana taxi now. They do this all the time. And, and, and in it was all of my stuff. It's gone because I didn't get to take out my tapes, my sunglasses, my books, my Altoids, and all the things that I had in that car. Fresh breath, it's a priority in my life. And, and it's just gone because you didn't expect it. Laura had these tapes that she would listen to of all these Broadway musicals. Laura was a theater major, and she enjoyed listening to those, and that was an answer to prayer, that those were stolen. <laughs> <laughs> you just didn't plan to walk out, and your car's gone. Every day it was there, and I got in for years, just clockwork, and the same way as every other day I come out, it's gone. It's like a thief, unexpected, caught me unawares. In the same way, he will come in glory and then the day of the Lord is going to be ushered in. It's going to be like a thief. It's going to come, much like Noah and the flood, where they're giving and work and marrying and partying and, and boom, the rain starts and the flood begins and they come and knock on that ark after ridiculing and mocking Noah after all those days and it was too late. And so will the day of the Lord begin. I just want to read to you what Jesus said about it. In Matthew 24, listen to Jesus. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. And for this reason, you be ready too. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of the household to give uh, them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. He's ready. And truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master's not coming for a long time, which has been the context of 2 Peter. And he shall begin to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour which he does not know, and he shall cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. And weeping shall be there and the gnashing of teeth. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they're saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you like a thief. And so it's going to come at a time when you don't expect it. And there'll be people telling you peace, peace, that everything's okay yet without the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of you don't even like this kind of speech this morning, and Jesus himself has told you it's going to come and it's going to come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. 
Look at verse 12 as well. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. And so the day of the Lord will come and we're told that the wrath is going to be released. The patience of God, that power that's holding back that wrath is going to be released and it's going to do away with all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It will be swept away. And so here, as I'm studying this, it sounds like the whole creation is just kind of burned up and disintegrated and gone. And it just seems strange to me that that God made this creation. In Genesis 6, he, he speaks and it's created, and he says it's good, it's good. He creates woman, and he says it's very good. This is very good. Shalom, everything is right under God and ordered and beautiful. What, what a creation until sin entered into it. It destroyed it all. So why burn it up and just be done with it completely? I've been to Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, Niagara Falls, Pikes Peak, St. Lucia. It just gets more and more beautiful to everything you ever see in this world. Why are we going to incinerate the whole thing? So here's what I think Scripture teaches about this, and I think this is important to our hope and our expectation. I want you to listen to what Paul wrote in Romans 8. For the anxious longing of the creation, here's creation, it's longing, it's waiting eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility when Adam and Eve sinned, not of its own will, but because of him, God, who subjected it. He did it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption and to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only creation, this, but we also ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoption as sons for the redemption of our body. So creation is groaning and longing for us to be redeemed and that completion to come, and it will be set free from its corruption. So there's, there's this continuity that they're longing to be set free, creation. So how do I kind of harmonize those two passages, Peter and Romans 8? And it's in this way. Peter's description of the end in this passage is a fiery judgment, but it doesn't say annihilation but rather it's a purging and a transformation of this creation. And that's the way he used it in 1 Peter 1 when he said we're put in the fiery furnace. It it purifies and purges our faith and gives us that approved faith. So what comes out of this judgment is going to be a new, purified, beautiful world as it was before the fall with all things now in this final state in perfect harmony under Christ once again. Look at 2 Peter 3, verse 6. He's talking about the judgment with Noah. And he says, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded by water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So he connects the water judgment with the fire judgment. And the water did not annihilate the world, but it cleansed it and purged it and drowned the evil. And the fire is going to come in the same way with this continuity. It's going to purge and it's going to refine this fallen world. And then in 2 Peter 3.13, look at it. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And so there'll be this new heaven and new earth, and it's going to be so radically different that it's going to be unimaginable as we know it today. It will be perfect and purged and just made beautiful. A new world where righteousness dwells, and the old world was destroyed because of unrighteousness. And this day of the Lord, he's telling, is going to come and bring this purging fire. And so here's what this whole sermon is about. So I want you to wake up and get ready because this is life changing. And my question is, so what? So what? That that's how this is going to end. What, what, it, what is this for us this day? And now I want you to look at verse 11 of 2 Peter 3. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct 
and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we're looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. And so let me introduce this to you. What, what is this to do that it's going to end this way? And Peter says it's to motivate you like nothing else. What about it is motivating? What jumps out at me is there, there's really no talk in this section here about your personal judgment. In chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, it was all about the judgment that will come upon the false teachers. God knows how to judge those who have been false teachers and sinful throughout the ages. And that whole section is showing God will bring personal judgment. And now in this section, there's not even a hint of it. The focus of Peter in these verses is just a world that's going to be burned up. And a new one is going to come out and be purified and purged where righteousness dwells. And so much is just left out of the how and the timing and all of that. But Peter says, since this is what's going to happen, these are the points I want you to have in your mind and your heart, what sort of people ought you to be? What should this do to you this morning as you sit here? And the question must be answered, if this is to help us, how is that motivation? The world is going to be burned up on the day of the Lord like a thief. How does that apply to us right now? And I just want you to think of that for a second. What does that do to your own heart as you think about this? What should this do to me is the question that Peter is seeking. And I'll tell you what comes to mind uh, then uh, in the text and, and, and bring it up perfectly. As I just think of when I lived in Florida and, and when I was young, uh, we used to go to the beach and we would just sit and make sandcastles. You know, and we'd make these sandcastles, and then the, the tide would come up, and it would just come and, and wash away those sandcastles. And what I see as I look out at this world is just a bunch of kids making sandcastles every day. That, that really, to me, is what this world is. It's just everybody making sandcastles, which I'm going to call trying to find meaning. Trying to do something with your life that will last. Trying to find purpose. What is it that will really make me happy? Everyone just every day is striving for that. Everyone's just looking. What, what will give me purpose? What will give me meaning? This younger generation thinks about this more than any generation. What, what can impact? What will have an effect? I'm trying to build something that lasts and it outlasts my life. And we all just come up with our mottos and all of our sayings about why, uh, what we're doing and to try to get the most purpose we come up with things like, he with the most toys wins. My, my purpose is to end with as many toys as I can get on earth to play with. My goal is to have money because with money comes power. I can change things and I can, I can pass it on and make a real difference to my children. And Solomon says, your children are going to take it and just blow it. It's futility. Family then is all that matters. Focus on the family. Pour yourself into your family. That's really why you're here. That's all that matters. And then when they die, something happens. They go astray. Then what are you going to do? And you know, is that why you're here? Is that your chief end? My chief end then is just a reputation in my industry. I want to write books and I want to be known as the best in my industry. My artistic expression. I just want it to go on. But I just want to tell you, most songs are here today and gone tomorrow. They just don't last I just want to build my sports card, card collection, my car collection, my crafts, or my pictures. I want to leave the world a better place than when I entered it. And I'm just going to tell you lots of luck with that. I blew that. This world is way wor worse than when I was born into it. <laughs> Discouraging. Thanks, Barnabas. <laughs> I want you to hear this clearly. I want you so badly to hear this. May the Spirit give you ears to hear. It's all going to burn up. All your sandcastles are going to be washed away by a purging fire. And none of those things are going to come through this fire. All the things that you're giving your life to and think are everything and your life's just about it, he's saying it's going to be burned up and purged with fire. It's going to be gone. 
It's just going to be incinerated. So why did I make that my life? Why did, I, why did I set my goal to make my whole life about those things? Why did I give all of my attention to that? Why would I do that? And I promise you that you, you, you will come to the end. And if you made your life those things, it's going to be futility and ignorance, and they're just going to be incinerated and burned up. <clears throat> and God told you it would all burn up. Peter's telling you this is how it's going to end. <laughs> I want you to know this is how this will come to an end. And you gave your life to making sandcastles, and the waves just kept coming in again and again and wiping them out, and you just started again saying, I'm going to build a different kind of sandcastle. I'm going to get a new wife, a better husband. I'm just going to find a new job, a new hobby, get my new house or or a new interest. And I just keep going from sandcastle to sandcastle and it just keeps getting wiped out. And at the very end of all of your life, it's going to be incinerated. I remember my son was interviewed after he was in the Aurora shooting. And it was by my friend Josh Weidman. And he was a pastor at that time at Mission Hills. And, and he came and he asked Jordan if he would come share about his experience. And he asked him, he said, what, what did you learn from this? And he said, well, first, that your life could end at any second. You're just sitting there watching a movie, and the next thing you know, there's this mass killings going on right in your presence. Just during a movie. And then second, he quoted a, a poem that I've been sharing with him his whole life. He said, only one life will, to, will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. What he realized in that theater, he said, is everything that he ever lived for will burn up. All the things that he thought were the chief end of man, football, and all these different things, all of a sudden, if, if I'm killed right here, all of those things meant nothing. There's only one thing that's going to come through the fires of this day of the Lord. And Peter says, holy conduct and godliness. Only what's done for Christ will last. You're storing up treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy. There's only one thing that's going to come through that. And I pray that we don't give ourselves to sandcastles and all of our lives to these things that are going to perish. So false teachers come under the power of Satan and so what's the message that they preach to us? They, they come and they preach lies about Christ and his work. But in this chapter, chapter 2, it's been about sexual immorality. It's been about greed and it's been about pride. It's been about this world. Grab the gusto. Go for it. Live it. Indulge your flesh. You're forgiven. You have the, the gospel. That's their message. Jesus plus this world. You can have all this world. No self-control, no moral excellence in striving for godliness. A life of love being poured out for other people is not their message. Their message is freedom. Christ died so you can have freedom to drink up this world. And Jesus is saying, guess what? It's going to burn. Listen to their message, indulge it, but everything you're indulging is just going to burn up. Don't make that your end and your chief pursuit. He says, I bought you out of that. I bought you out of the world, and in 2 Peter 1, 4, I, I brought you and you escaped the corruption of this world by your lusts. I took you out of that. I, I brought you to myself, and I've redeemed you. Why are you going back into it and drinking it up? It's just going to burn up at the end. Fight against false teachers. Maybe it's your own flesh that is lying to you. Or, 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 or it's false teachers that, that you just want to keep building your sandcastles here as your chief motivation. That is what is driving your heart. That's so what Peter is saying is this. Since we know with certainty the future of this world, guys, we know how redemptive history is going to end. There's an absolute certainty because of the sure word of God tells us again and again and again. And then what should be in the forefront of our lives? What should be our daily thoughts? And I'm going to show you. Three times he says, look for. Look in verse 12. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. 
Verse 13, but according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth. Verse 13, therefore, beloved, since you look for these things. The Greek word for look here, it means to be intensely looking for something. It's a beautiful word. It was used when Peter and John are walking. They come across this crippled man, and he's crying alms. He needs help. He's begging. And they, say, they said to the man, look at us. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give to you. Walk in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it was, look at us. Fix your gaze at us. Paul gets bit by that snake in Acts 28, and it says they were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly just fall down dead. But after they waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and began to say he was a god. So they're just looking at him, waiting for him to die. Their gaze is fixed on Paul. So people of God, be looking for this great reality. Day-to-day life, all the pressures and all the constraints that you're feeling this morning, Peter's saying, looking. And in Peter's day, all the pressures of society, no appliances, just survival was a day-to-day work. And he says, looking three times, be looking. Set your hope, fix your hope on this day. This is so hard because of the consumerism of our day. They're so good at marketing. We need this. We need that. Fix your hope on this. This is what will make you happy. It's just constantly at us. And it takes a real labor and a spiritual determination to be looking for this. Does your life look for this? This world is not my home. It's going to burn up. And, and, And I tried that this week. And I just went around just trying to look at everything with this mindset. It's going to burn up. It's going to burn up. I'm waiting for the new heaven and the new earth that's coming. And it was just so beautiful. I just looked my eyes out this week. I would, I would challenge you to do the same thing. To go out and just begin to look and say, it's going to burn up. It's going to burn up. How, how should I live? What should be my focus? What should be my hope? The new heavens and the new earth where Christ is going to be put on display for all of eternity. And you know what else happened this week? is I enjoyed all that God has given me more than I ever have enjoyed it. He called me to enjoy his blessings and to give thanks and to use them up before they burn up. (laughs) I just want to enjoy them before they're incinerated. What a beautiful gift from God. But they lost their power to give me hope. It was beautiful that I never treasured them more, but they never had less of a hold on my heart because they're just going to burn up. And so thank you, God, but my hope is in this coming of your return. So are you ready for your outline? I don't even want to say it. That was your introduction. But it wasn't really, because it it got in the text and it was wrestling with stuff, so don't feel like it was just introduction. It was kind of the the body of what I wanted to share. But uh, flip up there on the screen. Peter's going to give us two things then that will happen to us if this hope gets into our present heart. So how do I know if this coming day of the Lord is, is in my heart, I'm getting it, it's, it's wisdom now, it's not just the knowledge about it, it's affecting my day-to-day life, it's changing me, and we're going to look at two things. First, you're going to have a whole soul pursuit of a holy lifestyle, and secondly, you're going to have a whole soul pursuit of the salvation of other people. So look with me in verse 11 and 14. You're going to have a whole soul pursuit of a holy lifestyle. In verse 11, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? In holy conduct and godliness. If we believe in the day of the Lord, his day when he will, his glory will be put on display in the transformation of this world uh, where righteousness dwells, the response in our hearts will be holy living and godliness right back to chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, where we're diligent and we're making every effort to grow in these things. If this is how it's going to end, I, I want to be holy. And in verse 14, therefore, in light of this, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. To be found in peace is, man, I'm, I'm right with God. I know how this world's going to end, and I'm going to come through that fire purged and purified because of the work of Jesus Christ. Uh, I have a peace. 
I don't have to be frantic. I don't have to, I, when I hear about nuclear threats and the stuff in Iran and all that goes on, it just doesn't get in because I got peace because of this. I got peace with God. I got peace in my heart. I got peace with others. So as you're, as you're looking and hastening, what should you have? You should have peace and spotless <coughs> and blameless. Spotless and blameless. And look at uh, three verse, uh, never mind, oh my. Uh, if your life is this world, if your life is this world, it's the, uh, the bachelor. I've never seen it, I heard about it, it sounds stupid. Um, <laughs> if, if it's sitcoms and the American Idol, I'm just telling you, if that's what your life is, and some of you, that is your life, it will destroy you. Christianity today has become the lowest common denominator. What is the least thing I have to do to be a child of God? What's the lowest common denominator? Robert Murray McShane said in the 1800s, make me as holy as a redeemed man can possibly be on this side of glory. That's what this should do in your heart this morning. Quit playing games. I want to be as holy as a man, woman, or child can be on this side of glory because this is how it's all going to end and this is what's coming. Exhort one another. Love each other. Restore in conflict. Be forbearing. Don't have a judgmental spirit. Forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. Lock shields and fight with one another. Don't fight each other. Pursue after holiness without which no man will see the Lord. Uh, the day of the Lord demands a whole-souled pursuit of godliness and holiness. That has to be the response. I have to be after and pursuing and hunting down Holiness and godliness. Holiness, the, the internal consecrating, being set apart to God, and godliness, the actual outworkings of living before this God. That is the answer. That is what should be our response to the day of the Lord that could be coming as a thief in the night. A whole-souled pursuit of a holy lifestyle that you will be found looking, waiting, and ready for the King of Kings when he returns. Secondly, we should pursue the salvation of others. Look with me back at verse 9 of chapter 3. We already studied it. <clears throat> They're saying, where is the Lord? Why is he not here? And the Lord, a thousand uh, years is like one day. And he says in verse 9, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The, the waiting and patience of God is for his redeemed. Verse 15 Regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Uh, the, the longer that he waits, because he has waited, is why I stand here as a believer this morning. And so the, regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. There's a season, there's a time to go and beg people to enter the ark of Christ with the day of the Lord coming. When you see what the day of the Lord is, it, it should cause you to tremble. And to just walk by people and notice that they got a Nike swoosh on their shirt or what their car looks like is, is an abomination. The day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night to the people we walk by and live with in our houses every day. And he's saying it's, it's got to do something. In verse 12, it should cause you to look and hasten the coming of our Lord. So my question is, how do you hasten the coming of the Lord? <laughs> How do you do that? I want to do that. Well, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. This is how we're going to hasten the coming of the Lord. If you repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you remove a reason for his delay in his coming. Or we're praying the last one will come in of his people and he will return. So if you're unsaved this morning, repent and believe on Christ. Maybe he'll come back this hour. So please understand this. There's a sovereignty and a human responsibility. He said to them, Jesus in Acts 1-7, It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, he has declared when that day is and when it will come. But our responsibility, my friends, is to preach to all the nations and ingather God's people. That is our responsibility, and that's hastening, getting them in so that Jesus will return. And so we are to hasten this day to give our lives to the fulfillment of the Great Commission. 
We're, we're called. This is our calling. And not everyone might be gifted as an evangelist, but we're all doing all that we can to see souls come into the kingdom and be, avoid the coming wrath of God. We give tracts. We could do street evangelism, nursing home ministry, prison ministry. Get your neighbors, invite them in. Go love this world and proclaim this message. Bring them to studies. Pray, pray, pray. This is why we have time. This is time. Patience of God is salvation. This is why we exist. He's coming again. The door of the ark will be closed and many will knock on it and he will say, away from me, I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. And that would have been me, but for the patience of God and his mercy to bring his messengers to me with the glorious gospel. And so I'm calling you with all of my heart, wake up, and give your life to this. Hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us use every resource that we have unto this end. And don't just sit silently with this kind of a day coming and it's going to come like a thief and we won't even have time to run back and call them to repentance. This is the time. And it's got to do something to your heart and stir and cause you to be shamed for the gospel but unashamed of it. And so lastly, I want you to don't just focus that everything's going to burn up, but I want you to focus on, on what will come and I want you to see what's going to come as a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And so I want to close with the same reminder that I've given to this letter again and again. If you'll remember back in chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, Peter says there's promises and there's power in these promises in Christ. And they're the, the power that we're going to get to overcome the lusts and the defilements, the epithumias that we have in this world. So the way I'm going to overcome my, my lusts and desires is by the promises of God, not just being in my head, but, but getting into my heart. I, I need them to get in there. And so we need to daily set our eyes and our affections on the promise of the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness will dwell forever. What a finish line for this race. Run it with everything and you're just going to get to the finish line and have it forever. Pray that God will open the eyes of your hearts to this hope. Give us power, God, to fulfill the great commission. I'm weary of all the unrighteousness in this world and all the unrighteousness that is still in my own heart. Anybody weary of the sin in your own heart? Groan. Bring about redemption. Set this world free from its futility that it's been subject to. Come and bring in the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells. This is the way to overcome the temptation of this world all around us. The false teacher's message, they, they, we have a greater hope than what they offer. I have something better than my lusts in this stupid world. I have a greater reward, a greater blessing, a greater satisfaction than anything that this world can ever have. Fight to stay in these promises and hold them and to treasure them. So the application, as I close out, is just so clear. Um, it's just too clear. Why live for anything but Jesus Christ? You can have all this world. It's going to burn up. Give me Jesus. Only what's done for Christ will last. And it could be as simple as giving a cup to someone who's thirsty or naked and giving them clothes or in prison and visiting them or sharing the life-giving news of Christ or giving a car to someone, a house with someone or a meal. I just pray that only what's done for Christ will last. Everything else is going to burn up. And so I just say, give me Jesus. And I pray that every heart in here would cry for that and that alone. This is how it's going to end. And it should cause holiness. And it should cause a, a heart that wants to bring in the lost to be spared from this last day. And it's a heart that just can't wait for this place where there'll be no more unrighteousness in me or in anyone else. And we're going to dwell there forever and ever. Please don't settle for lesser things. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we'll quit making sandcastles. God, I pray that our hope is in this new heavens and new earth where righteousness dwells, where Christ will be seen in all of his glory and loved and adored by sight. God, we look for this day. We hasten it. We long for it. 
And so God, please let us, if we walked in here with our eyes on everything in this world, I pray now that you would lift them to this alone. God, I pray we'd take our hopes off of the things that are going to burn up and we would put them on the beautiful thing that will come through the fire and be purified and made spotless and blameless for all of eternity. God, I thank you for this gospel. Do your work individually now in every heart with this word. If there's repentance that needs to happen, God, let it take place even this morning. And if there's just uh, new commitments or resolutions that need to be done in hearts, God, I pray, let us be done with lesser things. Give our heart, mind, and soul to serve the King of Kings. I thank you, Jesus, for this blessed hope that we all share here this morning. Would you come back this day? It's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. And we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.